morning, everybody. Today we begin, uh, I want to introduce to you uh, Professor Harish Fuleria. Uh, he's going to be dealing with issues of water treatment, water quality. Please welcome uh, Professor Harish Fuleria. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sethi. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this is the day eight, and I hope that you're enjoying the lectures uh, by different faculty here. So today I'm going to introduce you the sub-module, the, the module on water pollution, and uh, start with water quality. And um, so I am uh, assistant professor in Center for Environmental Science and Engineering. And um, basically, um, the, this module is uh, kind of organized in terms of basically having some introduction to um, water pollution and the issues and then basically going into the water quality parameters. What are those which should be monitored? How do we monitor them? And then we'll go into the drinking water quality treatment, then wastewater treatment, and finally as maybe small time we'll spend also on noise pollution. So to start with, I would like to um, ask you to spend maybe three minutes on this uh, documented trailer by Irina Salina which was basically a documentary made in 2008. And this basically depicts uh, or kind of put together the conflicts related with water issues. Uh, it mentions about the greed issues from industry as well as actually the, the, the crisis of water in because of the increasing population pressure. And at the same time offers advice and guidance from many experts. So uh, I would like to basically open this link for you and uh, uh, please in, um, spend some time uh, on this and we will resume from there. So um, we just uh, watched this, uh, well, a small theoretical uh, trailer of this movie, uh, which probably you might have got that. Um, it's little bit the tone is against the industry, like how it is privatizing the water and basically this bottling industry, which is more than $400 billion uh, worldwide. But at the same time, this is a like, concurrent issue. And actually, we all want to have drinkable water. And when we are concerned about the water quality, we more likely choose, if we can afford, the water which is, we think, is safe enough to drink, and that's why we go for the bottled water. But the idea here was that we should take a pause and think about whether this is the right choice individually as, uh, as a nation or as, uh, you know, as a partner in the, the world community. Uh, before we begin, um, I think it's important to mention a couple of definitions. Uh, I am sure that all of you um, are very much aware about them, but I think it is important that for the undergraduate students who we are teaching, even though they have environmental studies in their, uh, you know, in the secondary uh, school as well as in the senior secondary uh, program, uh, but it is important that we have these distinctions made at the very beginning of when we are teaching about pollution or pollutants or contaminants. So a pollutant is defined as any solid, liquid, or gaseous substance which is present in such concentration that it may um, be or it can tend to be injur injurious to the environment or environment also considers the human environment, so basically also to human health. On the other hand, a contaminant may be defined as something which causes deviation from the normal composition of uh, an environment. So basically, if it is deviating from its natural concentration, then it's a contaminant. More likely, it is coming from the anthropogenic or our uh, you know, human origin activities than basically what is happening naturally. So a contaminant does not occur in nature, but gets introduced by human activity into the environment, and uh, th thereby it affects the composition of that particular substance in the nature. I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, that much of the material I'm going to present today and maybe also uh, tomorrow uh, is basically taken or adapted 
from uh, Professor Lokesh Padhyay's lectures on environmental studies, uh, which is a mandatory course uh, here uh, at IIT Bombay and of course uh, throughout India also uh, for undergraduate students uh, ES 200. And so basically I am taking uh, on adapting a lot of material from there uh, for the water module here. So after defining this definition, um, maybe we can quickly have a look at the water cycle. Probably you have seen it already uh, in um, uh, Professor Nichols' lecture on water resources. So he must have introduced the hydrological cycle. Uh, the only thing which I have um, added here is it says modern world water cycle. So if we just talk about water cycle, um, you see it's basically evaporation of the vapors then basically getting condensed, precipitating out and uh, well they could be evaporate from direct surface water bodies or they can transpire from the plants or so um, or even uh, other uh, like sea water bodies and then they precipitate out as rain and then can go to surface water bodies, uh, can seep into the groundwater and basically eventually end up into the ocean. They can go to the irrigation fields, then the runoff basically could go again with the, with the seepage to the groundwater aquifers and then it can uh, basically be uh, basically further uh, could go to the ocean waters. Now how the modern world water cycle is a little bit different is as you can see here is this, this water treatment plant is there which provides drinking water and then here is this sewage treatment plant which basically uh, improves the quality or basically maintains or the regulatory standard of the discharge water into the water bodies, whether this is uh, the water which goes to the surface water bodies or uh, for example directly to marine bodies if they are nearby. So eventually what is happening is this drinking water after the waste, uh, the water treatment plant, the drinking water is supplied to industry, to residential uh, households, to commercial uh, places and then thereby the sewage is generated or industrial effluents are generated and they basically goes to the sewage treatment plant or industrial treatment plants and then after the, you know, the, uh, the treatment they are uh, basically uh, discharged to uh, different water bodies according to the regulations. So in the modern world uh, the contribution of or the, the play off of uh, water treatment as well as sewage treatment is quite important and we must keep that in mind and actually as we will see as we move further and I am sure you are aware about that, this, will, this is the key uh, thing that we deal when we talk about water pollution and treatment. Um, maybe something about the water uses, so I am sure this has been also covered but just, just as a primer, so there is increased population pressure and if you look at the globe, uh, basically if we divide by uh, the high income countries like in North America to Africa and Asia, uh, what we can see is the per capita water availability is basically decreasing and this is because the population is increasing in all of these places. In general the water availability is higher in Northern America uh, and Africa because of the reduced population pressure in these places and maybe a little bit more water uh, availability in these places. But what we can clearly see is in all of these places the per capita water availability is decreasing. It's very interesting, so we um, are quite aware all of us about um, you know the export imports of commodities and as you are probably quite well aware water is now a commodity and actually there are countries, nations who are importing it. For example, this uh, is a table which presents the dependence of uh, the imp dependence of some selected countries on the imported surface water. So what you can see here is the countries and then the percent of the total flow which originate outside their national borders. So for example, Bangladesh uh, basically have 42 percent uh, flow which is outside their national border. We, as we know our Prime Minister was just in Bangladesh. They talked about various issues including the, 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 you know, the land deal and so, but it's still Tista river is still a bone of contention because it's still um, Bangladesh basically receives a lot of, uh, I mean the surface water from Tista river which, which goes through the uh, West Bengal and given that the increased pressure on the water resources is going to eventually anyway be even further, 
this is of course an important issue to deal with. And if you look at the ratio of external water supply to internal supply, you see like this is uh, 0 0.7 uh, for example for Bangladesh versus 32 for Egypt. So basically all these places above which are basically Egypt, Hungary, uh, Hungary is in uh, um, Eastern Europe, Mauritania is also in is Western Africa, Egypt and Gambia in West Africa, Syria is also there in Africa. So all of these places they do not have any water source. I mean, any surface water body, basically they are importing the drinking water from other nations. So with that, um, maybe uh, we can have, uh, we can spend another maybe about 7 to 8 minutes and basically go through this very interesting uh, video which uh, is basically describing the increasingly scarce resource uh, as the water is becoming and how we are responsible to it what are we consuming, where it, is be, where it is going and what we can do about it. At least it gives you some primers. So let us uh, let's spend about 7-8 minutes on that. Okay, so I hope uh, uh, you realize that uh, this was basically um, in the context of the United States. So while it said that an average American consumes about 160 gallons of water, one gallon of water is about 3.8 liters. Um, if we look at um, India, the average consumption which is given by the Bureau of Indian Standard the, in the code of water supply is about uh, 150 to 200 liters per day per head uh, for the population when it is more than 100,000. 100, so of course there are uh, these discrepancies in terms of those who are more affluent and can afford to waste uh, more water, uh, but eventually it is going to be an issue which a global issue which it is and so all of us have the uh, you know the responsibility to basically take this as a serious issue as we are doing for the other uh, problems as well. So uh, this was the video which mentioned about like how in which activities do we consume the water at the same time mentioned like how water basically comprise and like for example less than 0 0.007 percent of the water is available as the fresh water to be consumed. So uh, just to put it in context if you look at the water uses as individual house or at individual household level and again this is basically from um, the, the United States basically this is from this book Masses and ELA 2008 uh, introduction to environmental science and engineering and if you look at household water uses and in liters you can see that the one on the top basically is the standard toilet per flush which is about 10 to 30 liters um, per household. Then uh, basically if some of the more conscious consumers if they have introduced ultra low volume toilets so basically those where uh, either they have dual system of toilet flushing or basically a better toilet system where lesser water is needed per flush then it basically reduced down almost half to 1.6 uh, uh, gallons or about 6 liters uh, per household. Then you see like dishwasher is about 50 to 120 liters per load, um, water saver dishwasher again a little bit less but still this is quite high compared to for example uh, let us say uh, water when we use it for shower which is, is still high but far less than that and then obviously for cooking and other purposes it is quite less. Now one of the questions that uh, I would say that uh, we can pose, we, I mean I, you, all of us can pose to our students is are they aware consciously about the, their water budget. So meaning that in which activities how much water do they consume um, and um, if, if they can basically document that and if this could be given as an assignment to the students and basically depending on where they come from, depending on which kind of uh, families they come from, areas, urban, rural, all those 
uh, we will see that the, the different uh, activities that they are going to use water will be different. Now, for example, it says here for shower head is about 20 to 30 liters. Now, uh, this is actually in, in some in lower case, I think it is per minute, oh by the way, this is per minute. So, now if somebody takes uh, about 5 to 10 minutes, it is a it is about 5 to 10 times of this, which is about 100 to 200 liters per shower. Now, that is really a lot, because for India, for example, I, as I mentioned, uh, the average per person, uh, you know, overall total uh, water supply that is given as a code uh, is basically about 150 to 200 liters. So, what could be done basically instead of a shower if somebody takes um, is conscious and, and uh, takes a bath with a bucket or so definitely we can save a lot of water. Now, this is individual choice this is something that cannot be mandated this has to come from our own awareness and I think this is a good platform to basically discuss about it uh, as a group, as a community uh, in the classrooms and basically advocate saving water. So, that was also the message in the previous video. So, this is what I was mentioning. So, from the Bureau of Indian Standards, the basic requirement of the urban water supply. So, basically if it is for communities with a population of over 100,000 with full flushing system, then it advises that the water that should be given to them is about 150 to 200 liters per head per day. And also what you see here is out of the 150 to 200 liters per head per day, 45 liters per day which is about 25 percent is basically uh, should be taken for the flushing requirement. So, this is one fourth of the total. So, when you will basically ask the students or actually check yourself where I am basically consuming water you will realize that actually one of the dominant activity which is consuming a lot of water is actually flushing. Okay. So, this was basically about uh, you know some uh, you know kind of uh, uh, like background on the on the water issues and the scarcity and you know how basically in the world as well as at individual levels uh, you know uh, how this is basically distributed. Let us look at something uh, from historical point of view how uh, we why basically there is a problem of water I mean drinking water. So, if we go back to 1854 there was a cholera outbreak in London which was actually um, was around this broad street Broadway street in London and basically a lot of uh, cholera cases were reported around this which are basically shown in these black dots which may not be quite visible, but I mean wherever you see like dark black thing these are basically all these places from where uh, these cases were reported. And this place where this T kind of thing is basically uh, is here this is where the actual pump from where uh, the people were consuming the water in around this area. So, it was actually um, it is very interesting to, to know and I am sure that you more, more or less most of you should be knowing this that before 1854 cholera was uh, assumed to be uh, you know spread by air not by water. It was basically John Snow who demonstrated that basically this Broadway pump uh, you know it was a hand pump which was responsible for basically having this cholera outbreak in this area and around this area. And uh, basically the pathogen in that water basically coming from the sewage a contamination from one of the, the lines uh, which was broken and basically all the people who were uh, consuming water from, from this or most of the people consuming water from there basically fall ill. While that was not the case with many other people who are around and taking or consuming water from the other uh, you know hand pumps which were not contaminated with this. So, this was interesting discovery of course, a later a uh, uh, lot later of in basically 1880s or so John Hook basically uh, se segregated the pathogens and basically cultured the microbes uh, responsible for these kind of uh, you know uh, 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 pathogenesis. And in the current day basically John Snow this at this broader street there is a cafe which is named John Snow 
in the memory of uh, you know John Snow's this uh, remarkable work, uh, which basically paved the way for water disinfection. Basically, it was um, around 1890 uh, in, uh, in in London and about 1903 in New York and New Jersey, where the first water supply uh, for the city was established with dis disinfection. So. Uh, this is this is I think a remarkable point in the journey of where basically we started treating water. Now, when we talk about cholera, basically this is one of the prevalent diseases, but there are many pathogens in water which could basically uh, more or less coming from the human excreta or human feces, which gets contaminated either directly, consciously, uh, well, uh, in a way means like igno ignoring that it might be or maybe uh, basically non consciously, but because otherwise it is basically being uh, you know uh, uh, transported to some of the surface water bodies from where the water is being consumed. So, as we can see in this table there are viruses, the broad categories the viruses, the bacterium, protozoa and helminths, which are the pathogens which are found in the excreta of human faces. And as you can see on the right side, what are the, the, the associated diseases are mentioned and you can see for example, um, typhoid fever, uh, you know gastroenteritis, cholera, diarrhea, um, dysentery and some of the specific ones with the worms are mentioned here. Um, currently still to date, so basically it was in 1854, still today cholera, typhoid and dysentery are the three major water borne diseases which are affecting. Uh, millions of people, especially children uh, worldwide, uh, mostly in low and middle income countries. So, which I was mentioning, so basically that was uh, uh, like back in 1854, but if you look at uh, this the one of the recent data sets from World Health Organization, which reported or basically collated the information on the total number of cases of cholera between 2007 and 2009 and basically showed in this map where these cases were observed. The size of these uh, circles or spheres basically show how many uh, people were got affected. So, basically if you look at India, it is about 10,000 uh, between 10,000 and 20,000, but if you look at some of the southern part of the Africa or even also the eastern part of the Africa, where uh, even, even also in Iraq, we see that it could be as high as 100,000 or even more than 50,000 people. Now, this is of course a concern because this is what has been seen. You can see that most in most of the Western Europe or almost in the whole Europe, as well as in the Northern America, basically there is no almost no cases of cholera because more or less they have assured uh, treated safe drinking water to uh, most of the people which is basically free of these pathogens, uh, which are responsible for example, for the cholera, which is not the case for example, most of the uh, low income countries. For instance, in uh, Professor Nichols lecture you uh, must have came across come across that more than 60,000 villages in India do not have access to drinking water. So, how do they how do they manage uh, drinking water? The previous documentary said that there are people in the world who gets just 3 gallons per day, less than 3 gallons per day water. So, they just barely get water to drink and be alive. As we all know, one can stay alive uh, without food for up to a month or more, but it is very difficult to survive uh, without, without drinking water more than a week. So, this is uh, really uh, uh, of, of high importance. So, now um, with the, the aspirations and the industrial uh, revolution as well as the population increase, there were more diseases, there were more contamination, there were more infections and as well as newer discoveries. Even not only discoveries of uh, newer compounds and chemicals, but also newer drugs. So, to treat uh, and to basically have a better living, so to provide the, the disease people or the people with, with whatever water bond morbidity uh, you know recover from that and have a healthier life. So, over the last 100 years 
we have benefited from new drugs and other products in our quest for better living. Now, this better living is through chemistry and when we are saying chemistry, this is basically synthesis, synthesis of newer molecules. So, if they are released in the environment as per our previous definitions, they will be the contaminants, because the nature is not ready to basically assimilate them in uh, and basically uh, you know bring them down to a safer level that they are no more a pollutant. As we said the pollutant is that concentration of a substance above which basically it can cause some damage to environment or human or animal health. A water environment federation paper estimated about 80,000 different chemicals were released into the environment over this time, over this last 100 years and all of this were basically to target different, different uh, diseases or ailments. So, with that we come to, so basically we are introducing these contaminants in the water, because these are not natural, this is what we are doing. Of course, we are doing it for another reason, but it is an, it is a artifact or uh, basically a, a byproduct of whatever we are producing as a good for us whether this is like some material construction, which could be like nano materials for example, which could be plastics, which could be pharmaceutical drugs, which could be pesticides for increased production uh, you know of agricultural crops. But all of these eventually, because either the land or the water bodies are not uh, you know prepared or ready to assimilate them and they become contaminant. Obviously, not all of these substances can uh, accurately be described as pollutants, because if their concentrations are not above a certain limit that they pose any risk, they are contaminants, but not necessarily pollutants. Some of these substances are found naturally in surface waters of course, and the others are natural substances that are concentrated by anthropogenic activity. So, not only we are, I mean our activities in the last 100 years or so uh, are basically introducing new uh, contaminants in the environment, but also we are concentrating the natural substances and as their concentration increase more than a limit, they becomes pollutant. And still there are man made chemicals that do not occur in nature, so that was essential. So, the chemicals which we are introducing in the nature, so they uh, of course, can uh, again become uh, uh, pollutants as well. These contaminants can be classified based for example, from source for example, the industrial contaminants which are basically originating from industries of a specific nature, whether this is process, whether this is synthesis, whether this is production. Uh, this could be coming from household, it could be household activities like for example, household sprays which are being used, the cleaning agents which are being used, uh, basically cleaning utensils with detergents uh, and all those things, they are actually ending up in the environment and these are not natural, they are man made. They could also come from agricultural activities, for example, pesticides which are used in agriculture, they are they basically uh, you know uh, they could end up into the, uh, the surfaces of the plants and the crops, but at the same time they can be assimilated in the roots, they could be assimilated in the soil, seep through the ground water and eventually come into our water bodies. Or they could be classified by nature, for example, physical contaminants. Uh, for example, solid physical by virtue of their physical characteristics they pose risk. Uh, for example, chemical characteristics, chemical contaminants like most of the heavy metals, organic pollutants which basically pose risk because of their chemical activity, redox potential and uh, high reactivity. And they could be also classified as biological agents, for example, pathogens, microbes which, so they are not necessarily coming naturally, they are also coming for example, uh, from biological warfare material, they are coming from explosives. So, uh, from these uh, places also biological material can be introduced. For example, anthrax is one of the biological material which was introduced. Now, with that we uh, maybe uh, spend a little bit time on emerging contaminants. So, there are some contaminants which we are seeing very recently. So, in the last 40, 50 years, these are mostly industrial chemicals. For example, they can end up into our septic tanks, uh, they could basically go to waste water treatment plant, if we have a sewer supply and basically collecting all the raw 
waste water or sewage which is generated by individual households or uh, commercial places. And then if they are applied to land applications, they can also end up there. From all of these three places, whether directly from the septic tank or from the discharge waste water from the waste water treatment plant and after the basically runoff from the land applications or agriculture, they can end up into lakes, streams, river, groundwater, which are actually the sources of our drinking water. So, eventually these contaminants are ending up into our drinking water and which neither the environment nor us, we are also not ready to basically uh, tackle some of these chemicals, because uh, they are new and our immune system is not ready and uh, you know adapted towards them. For example, some of the emerging contaminants could be pharmaceutically active chemicals. All of us basically consume drugs when we are sick, uh, we take many times uh, antibiotics, we take anti-inflammatory and of course, uh, anti-allergens and for prolonged kind of exposures, we take anti-cancer drugs. Uh, these pharmaceutically active compounds basically have a very slow decay, mostly they are lipophilic. So, they are water repellent. So, most of the times they do not get easily degraded. At the same time, these are new compounds which are introduced in the environment. So, the microbes themselves are not ready to degrade them. And as we will basically cover in the next lecture, uh, when we will talk about the BOD, which is biochemical oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand COD, we will see why this is very important. If much of the organic waste which is being released is human generated and uh, basically persistent and very slow to be decayed, then this will basically bypass the wastewater treatment plant, because most of them are using biological secondary treatment. And so, they can these microbes can degrade the biologically biological material which is which would be degraded, but not necessarily these persistent organic or inorganic compounds which we are for example, coming from the pharmaceutical. They could also come or found in personal care products for example, disinfectants, antiseptics, sun, sunscreens etcetera. One of the major concerns with antibiotics is the development of antibiotic resistant strains of pathogenic bacteria due to overuse of the drugs. Uh, I am not sure, but you may many of you may have uh, basically read the news. Uh, for example, in the last uh, 5 years or so, I, I would say 10 years that first thing India is the uh, you know uh, is the basically capital of the TB epidemic. We have most number of tuberculosis cases in India. And then at the same time, then from the generic TB, basically it uh, you know changed to like drug resistant TB and then geno you know multi drug resistant TB. So, basically uh, because this is bacterial uh, based disease, so for which antibiotic is prescribed most of the times and because of the uh, you know like uh, uh, not a very uh, prescribed use of these uh, you know uh, or the overuse of these antibiotic drugs, uh, many of them basically end up into our water reservoirs. So, large amount of these antibiotics leaves the body, because they do not get metabolized and basically end up into our urine or feces as a mixture of either parent compounds or metabolites, both of which are very difficult to degrade further uh, biologically. And so, they end up in our water reservoirs. Other kind of emerging contaminants, which are quite uh, of concerns are endocrine disrupting chemicals, there is a, a typo here, uh, this is endocrine disrupting chemicals. So, these EDCs are substances, which are mostly synthetic that mimic a hormone in endocrine system and disrupts the function of the hormone. And as we know, the hormones are very important in developmental uh, progress in neurological development. And so, eventually these some of these EDCs may result in developmental abnormalities as well as neurological disorders. The important uh, thing to consider here is unlike for example, some of the pathogens like uh, the case of which cause cholera, dysentery or um, other kind of water borne diseases. Um, 
in case of the EDCs or pharmaceutical uh, compounds or all of these organic or heavy metals, they have a low dose, but very prolonged exposures. So, most of the time they do not result into the same diseases as which were caused by the other waterborne uh, you know factors like pathogens. So, mostly they end up into for example, cancerous or as we said these developmental abnormalities or neurological disorders. Uh, some of the EDCs uh, include for example, pesticides, uh, polychlorobiphenyls, poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins etcetera. For example, DDT which is a pesticide, bisphenol A which comes from plastic water bottles or you know the, the liners which is used in the vegetable cans. For example, estrogenic substances like birth control pills, they may have also some of these uh, I mean the, the, the compound there basically act as EDCs and for example, phthalates or so which are used in making the toys and uh, are used also in air fresheners. Lastly, the emerging contaminants are disinfection by products. As most of us know that basically the drinking water which is supplied to uh, to uh, you know through the public water supply systems basically is disinfected by using chlorine and which is a very good thing and uh, as we will also cover that later in the next lecture about the you know the chlorine disinfection and other uh, kind of disinfection. Um, one of the problems with that is the uh, you know generation of disinfection by products. So, basically the natural organic matter present in the drinking water when it basically comes in contact with the chlorine it gets oxidized and basically result into some of these uh, disinfection by products which could include trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids and so and which are known as or at least assumed to be suspected carcinogens and they specifically affect the reproduction system. And because this is like public water supply, so basically it goes to millions or billions of the people. So, a large population is exposed to the disinfection byproducts. So, if we basically talk about for example, a contamination by some of the pathogens, then that is a more likely a local phenomena. For example, like in case of cholera that was basically in 1854 that was basically restricted to that you know the very small area around that pump from where the people were consuming the water. In this case, this water is basically going everywhere with same kind of disinfection uh, applied most of the places. So, everybody is basically consuming the resulting disinfection by products like trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. For example, one of the emerging another dye uh, you know disinfection by products is like nitrosamines which are nitrogenous uh, uh, disinfection by products. So, one should be also you know uh, like cautious about that. So, now what does that all mean? So, for example, in this cartoon very nicely if you see this newspaper it says that drugs found in water supply and then you know most of these people who are water conscious and do not want to have the tap the bottled water uh, they say oh we will have the tap water because this is basically uh, you know coming through disinfection and, and, and a good water treatment system. So, now the other person is saying do you have a prescription because many of the drugs are ending into that. So, which is of course, of concern because so far we were dealing with or the world was dealing I think until, until for example, the early 20th century we were dealing with the, the uh, you know uh, the diseases of infection or the, uh, the diseases which were contagious, but now we are basically uh, in a in a regime change we are dealing with diseases which are chronic, which are non communicable and which are basically coming after a prolonged exposure to low doses. So, it is very very important to, to keep that fact in mind and basically uh, you know uh, communicate to this to the our you know leaders of tomorrow which are the undergraduate students who we are uh, going to teach. Now, in terms of the human health impacts uh, for example, there are some studies like uh, one by Nelson and Bungay in 1974 they found lower sperm counts um, in men in LA, New York and Minneapolis uh, uh, compared to this in Missouri because uh, there uh, they have uh, for example, some of these higher uh, amount of uh, um, uh, disinfection by products or some of the pharmaceutical active EDC compounds. 
for example, the other study confirmed the earlier study and for example, you can see the atrazine, alkalor and these are the specific compounds which are basically pharmaceutical compounds which were found in the Missouri water which was basically responsible for this low sperm count. As you remember from the previous slide, you may remember I said that some of these compounds are basically responsible for lower reproductive, lower reproductivity in humans. There is a link between pesticides and reproductive effect which was also established by this study. Um, the people were not exposed occupationally and what was found was that this, this drinking water was contaminated. More health impacts basically birth defects was found in uh, male reproductive organs basically it was doubled from 1971 which is basically sheerly because of the overuse or the uh, you know additional use of drugs over the 20 years. Dioxin problems in monkeys was found link between increase in breast, testicular and prostate cancers over last 40 years. It is very important to keep this, this time frame in mind. So, it was basically last 40 years. So, all the people who were in their 60s or you know more than 50s, if they were continuously drinking the water which was basically uh, contaminated with some of these EDCs or the emerging contaminants, they were responsible for uh, well at least it seems like they were responsible for the increase in some of these cancers all linked to hormone mimicking or disrupting compounds. So, which basically indicate the EDC nature of these contaminants meaning they are endocrine disrupting chemicals. So, large, let me lastly we come to the place like what makes something a poison. So, as uh, the great philosopher Parsons said uh, you know back in the 15th century uh, or basically 16th century no substance is a poison by itself it is the dose that makes a substance a poison. And the dose is basically a function of the concentration and the exposure and the risk what it poses to is basically a function of the toxicity and the exposure. So, how toxic is something and how likely somebody is going to expose with that poses a risk from that and that it becomes a poison. For example, uh, we can explain it in the way that uh, for example, there are the, like few of the uh, snakes like uh, like cobra, crat and vipers are one of the uh, are few of the most dangerous snakes with the deadly poison they have. Now, if you want to see what is the risk that they pose to the larger population, we need to see the toxicity is high, but the exposure is low because there are few number of cases where they bite humans because the human animal conflict when that happens only then they bite the humans. So, compared to that if we say okay, a large like for example, millions of people in large cities which are consuming for example, drinking water which is contaminated or basically having some of these disinfection byproducts or EDCs are actually in total uh, would pose more risk to the population than for example, this highly toxic uh, uh, like venom. Now, if we just look at like for example, uh, some of the sources of uh, water for us like surface water for example, rivers. So, what are the factors which impair the surface waters? So, for example, this uh, figure shows uh, on the x axis the percent uh, of the impairment uh, by these different factors which are the pollutants or stressors how they basically uh, you know impair. Impair means that they uh, make the water undrinkable or unhealthy to drink. So, for example, 35 percent or of so as we can guess mostly come from the pathogens. So, they are responsible for 35 percent of the water uh, you know surface river waters not drinkable because of the contamin or uh, I mean introduction of the pathogens. Siltation, um, habitat alterations, uh, oxygen depleting substances because they reduce the, the oxygen concentration and thereby affect the microbiology and the ecosystem of the water bodies and eventually disrupt uh, you know the water quality. For example, nutrients like phosphorus and, and nitrogen which comes from eutrophication from agriculture runoff, thermal modification if, uh, if water which is discharged to the water has higher temperatures then of course, that may also affect the uh, and impair the water for, uh, for further use. And then also there could be metals and the flow alteration is for example, 
if uh, a dam is built or you know some of the water is basically diverted to something else, then that can also impair uh, you know the quality uh, water quality and the amount of water available uh, for drinking purposes. If we look at it by source, so for example, agriculture for rivers is the most dominant source about 40 percent, then the hydrological modification which I was mentioning earlier, uh, urban runoffs from storm sewers and as you have also uh, probably uh, learned from Professor Nichols lecture that it is the sanitation is one of the primary I mean not having uh, you know good sanitation and sewage treatment of the domestic wastewater is one of the primary reasons why our surface water bodies are basically being contaminated. And then of course, there is also contribution from uh, atmospheric deposition, uh, also some non point sources and for example, disposal from the land. If we look at lakes, then basically it is the nutrients. So, compared to the rivers where the water is flowing. So, the basically the build up of some of these uh, uh, substances does not take place. On the other hand, lakes basically receive a lot of runoff water from agricultural lands from uh, you know some of the uh, commercial and uh, domestic household activities. And so, nutrients basically this is again coming from mostly agriculture, uh, also some of the phosphorus and also is coming basically from the domestic uses. Metals, uh, siltation, TDS, uh, again oxygen depleting substances. So, but in this case important thing to remember is that uh, about 50 to 40, uh, about 50 and 40 percent of the impairment of the lake water quality is because of the nutrient and metals uh, and, and less so from the pathogens which was the case with the river water. If we look at by source, we see that agriculture as we saw earlier 50 percent was basically from the nutrients, hydrological modifications, habitat modification all of those are also associated with the depleting oxygen concentration and the thermal uh, you know segregation in the lakes and uh, also of course, some of the point sources and, um, and some uh, urban runoff from the storm sewers. So, uh, with that we come to the water and wastewater. I mean basically both are important. So, on the one hand we need water uh, drinking water for us, but then that is basically quickly turned into wastewater. So, we must treat that and for that wastewater treatment plants are uh, established in most part of the world where they can afford it. Interestingly, uh, in 2013 or since 2013 the water environment federation no more called them wastewater treatment plants, but they call it water resource recovery facilities. Because the wastewater is actually a plentiful of resource with the diminishing availability of the drinking water or the clean water surface water available gradually we will have to resort to some of the wastewater and basically reclaim or recover water from this as well as nutrients as well as energy. So, that you know this could become a resource. So, instead of calling it wastewater treatment plant this is now being referred as water resource recovery facilities. This is important to communicate to the students that they should not see waste as something which is waste. It could have value, it could have you know economic value actually also as well as value which for example, in terms of the scarce resources it could provide uh, you know for example, drinking water and some of the energy needs could be fulfilled through that. So, which means that we have to treat water, but then why we treat. So, basically to protect the public health, to meet regulatory requirements and to protect the quality of the surface water body. Now, I am sure all of you will agree with me on this. If we are given enough energy input which is a function of the resources money, how much money we can invest into it, any chemical can be removed from water. The question is, is the benefit worth the impact and this is very important to, to raise this, because while we should be very conscious about uh, the scarcity of water uh, and at the same time that there are you know methods available, advanced methods available for treating the water we should also keep the economics in mind, we should keep the feasibility and the practicality of the uh, available methods in mind. Because at one point we will be, we'll be constrained by the resources by energy or by money. So, for example, this uh, graph uh, shows like the 
per capita energy use, so per meter cube of energy use if we use uh, some of these kind of disinfection methods to treat uh, the water. So, for example, fluorination or UV or UV is ultraviolet disinfection method, ozone as a disinfectant or a combination of ozone and some of the advanced oxidation methods. Some of these we will dis, uh, discuss uh, in the next lecture. What you see here is basically the cost per unit, uh, I mean the energy consumed per uh, unit of water treated is basically increasing as we move for the more advanced methods. So, chlorine as you can see is not by chance the default method of disinfection over the world. And it is only very like recently when we are seeing the, uh, the risks of the disinfection byproducts because of the chlorine uh, that uh, now uh, increasingly people are talking and discussing and researching about what other alternative disinfection methods are there. For example, this other graph on the right hand side basically puts a dollar value to some of these. Uh, so, the methods uh, uh, here are chlorine, chloramines, chlorine dioxide, ultraviolet light and ozone as five different disinfection methods. And as you can see, if you are treating a very low volume of uh, water, then the per, per meter cube of water basically there is very high cost for some of the advanced like ozone and UV treatment, even uh, also for example, chloramines. And there is low cost, obviously the lowest cost for chlorine. But as uh, we increase uh, the amount of water treated, we see that uh, you know it is basically the principle of marginalized return. So, eventually at high volume treatment, basically the cost is uh, you know uh, optimized and more or less most of the methods are quite comparable in terms of uh, the amount of money that requires to be disinfected by them. So, in general basically we have this impact cycle where basically uh, there is increased wastewater because of the influence on the drinking water, uh, which could be because of the increased population growth, sometimes drought could happen and then we need uh, novel treatment technologies which basically another factor comes in there is like the greenhouse gas emission. So, more the energy that we use to treat this does not come uh, free basically of course, there is a cost associated with treatment, but as well as the greenhouse gas emissions, which as most of us are aware basically leads to some of the larger global issues like climate change, which eventually could trigger some of the drought events or flood events and basically uh, you know this is a cycle which could uh, you know run on and on. So, the key message from this uh, which uh, I would like to uh, you know give and you would like to also give to your students is that most of these persistent uh, you know uh, chemicals or these endocrine disrupting chemicals have been documented actually already uh, for some time now like more than 40 years. And if we really look hard we will find that the contaminants uh, they are contaminants we will find the contaminants we look hard means that we will find these contaminants in uh, low concentrations. And as we know there is, there is no treatment process which is perfect, there is always a play off between contaminant reduction versus pollution relocation, because maybe we are transferring the pollution from one side. So, basically many of the treatment as we will also briefly touch in our uh, you know wastewater treatment or even water treatment basically mostly wastewater treatment basically the contaminants which are not able to be uh, removed from the environment are basically uh, you know uh, come out as sludge and then dewatered and then basically if they are not biodegradable mostly they are not and then they are taken to landfills. So, it turns out to be a you know reduction of the uh, contaminants from water basically to land pollution. Uh, another thing is the cleaner water versus carbon footprint which is about like the more that we treat more energy we consume more is the carbon footprint from that. Some other message we can give is that for all these reasons we have to basically take an ecological perspective in mind. So, ecological concern must be addressed which means that we have to take it as a whole big system not that the problem is resolved from my end or you know as a local body, but like how this is affecting a whole ecological system which is basically in the watershed or in the large region. We should strive for cleaner and safer water and obviously there will be a cost 
and the public will have to bear the cost. That needs to be also communicated. For example, if all of us when we want to have you know uh, uh, safe drinking water and we are not sure of the tap water or the you know surface water which is available maybe where we go to further you know some places where which is not our you know hometowns or so, we more likely will basically go to some of these stores and buy the bottled water. We are paying for that and same thing we will have to do for cleaning the water uh, and basically making it available for everyone. Now, the only important thing to consider is those who can afford more like the taxation, maybe they need to bear it more, but that is something which is not in the you know uh, uh, context of this course. The world will depend on the water reuse of course, because uh, of the you know uh, uh, the increasing uh, drinking water or the fresh water uh, bodies and the water scarcity. Trace contaminants will be detected and if treatment is needed wastewater makes more sense. So, it makes sense to treat wastewater basically recover some of the nutrients, uh, rec use some of the if you use anaerobic process for example, then some of the methane which is produced could be used for energy generation and then at the same time we can get the drinking water. So, at the same time the last key message must be also given is a more efficient treatment have to have more cost to the public and that needs to be uh, you know acknowledged. With this uh, let us come to some uh, like discussion points. So, uh, I think this is something that you can uh, basically discuss in your class uh, to all the students for example, are they aware what is the source of the drinking water in their household and are they treating it before they are consuming it what method they are using to treat it. So, this could be something that uh, you know you could take it as an exercise and we can also spend maybe uh, 5 minutes or so here to discuss that. And the other thing is uh, you have already a module on air pollution and you saw like how this that was more ubiquitous. Now, how are the exposure pathways to water contaminants different for example, than say air pollutants. So, that also needs to be understood because as we see the risk is a function of the toxicity as well as exposure and if we are not uh, you know uh, aware about the exposure pathways, then we may miss the mechanism as well as the impacts of the contaminated or polluted water to the human health. So, hi Savita Engineering College Tamil Nadu, ok. Um, good morning, um, so good morning sir, good morning. So, what is um, I am sure that you all are from different parts of Tamil Nadu, is, is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, of course, which means that we cannot just go on an individual basis, but let us say if we can say in terms of urban, you know, metropolitan or rural areas, what are the sources of drinking water in the household? And if we know about that, then what are, is there any pre treatment which is being done? before the water is being consumed. So, maybe a few of you would like to mention something about that. Uh, in Chennai, uh, the water is coming from uh, different rivers around the, which is uh, around 50 kilometers of Chennai and all are treated, uh, basic uh, treatments are done and then been supplied to the households uh, by different piping systems. Okay. Sir, in Chennai, uh, we have a lot of desalination plants. Uh, we are taking water from sea uh, to meet demand uh, to meet the demands uh, because uh, most of the groundwater is polluted and also uh, the river Kuom is uh, highly polluted. We cannot take the water for drinking. Right. So what the government is doing? They are storing water in uh, near, nearly four reservoirs like Pundi, Red Hills, and Chembramakam near our college. Apart from that, we are meeting the water demand from the desalination plants which are executed in the uh, two places in Tamil Nadu in Chennai, one is it at Minjur, another one is in Nemeli, so near Mahabharibram. So, this is the place where we are treating the water and we are supplying water to the, all the people. Uh, I think uh, there is no scarcity now. So, you are saying in Chennai there is no scarcity? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question sir. Please go ahead. So, we have a uh, rivers. The river pollution I want to talk about something. So, look at that now the government of India is going to clean the river Ganges. Uh, 
through Water Resources Ministry, and Ms. Uma Bharati is the uh, minister for that. And they are going to clean for uh, nearly you know, another couple of years. But one of the senior leaders said, uh, it is impossible to clean the water even 50 years. Such a pollution is there in the Ganges River. So what, you, what, what I can tell you is, you, you can suggest the Ministry of Water Resources through this conference or through this short-term training program, orient to form a uh, police protective force or river production force like railway force or like what you have, central industrial force, that we can have a solution for protecting rivers to avoid pollutions. Is it possible, sir? I think it's a very good point that you mentioned and you raised. I think, yeah, that is what we, not only with, uh, you know, just the issue of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, reclaiming or, you know, bringing the, the river water to, you know, acceptable, you know, uh, uh, level of water quality. It is, I think, in general a case with many of the issues where basically there is, there are two things. One is whether we have the technical know-how and affordable treatment system that could be put in place. It could be, I mean, I mean it's, it's a post hoc treatment or it could be also a preventive method. For example, in case of many of the river system, as all of you must be very aware, it is more preventive. If we can just make sure that most of the sewage that enters into these surface water bodies could be basically treated by these, you know, STPs and to a level that it is basically being taken care by, you know, the natural cleansing by the rivers, then, I mean, part of the problem is resolved. But at the same time, what you mentioned is there is need of a political will and you are absolutely right. This requires basically to, to kind of have a forum which could basically, you know, have this registered and as a, as a you know, uh, uni vocal voice basically mention that there is know-how, there is, uh, you know, uh, willingness by the local bodies or the state bodies and so basically at the union level as well as the state level, uh, you know, they could be basically, uh, you know, uh, advised as well as uh, kind of persuaded that this could be taken even with a more vigorous uh, effort. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so let's, um, um, yeah, go back because we do not have that much time. So uh, maybe I will quickly uh, go to some of the next slides and, uh, uh, you know, leave you with this, these questions and maybe when we resume tomorrow morning, we can spend maybe uh, five, ten minutes on some of these questions and, uh, you know, take your queries as well as your information. I think it was very interesting to know from uh, Tamil Nadu, for example, that they have desalination plants and they are uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, providing the, the drinking water from there. So with that, let's say move to the water quality parameters. Uh, so, because as we see, like we need to treat the water, but then what do we want to treat? To what level? How do we know that? So, we need to have some measure which is basically defined based on the different water quality parameters and there is a guideline which is given by, for example, US EPA, by WHO. We have also CPCB guidelines about what should be the drinking water quality parameters, what should be the, uh, you know, regulations for the water quality of, uh, you know, any water which is discharged to, for example, fisheries, uh, you know, or aquatic water bodies, I mean, the, the, the aquatic marine water bodies, and so and so. So, um, which basically bring me to this water quality standard guidelines by CPCB. There's a link there, which you, I think you, most of you may have already uh, visited. So, this A, so you have these five columns here. Uh, so, basically, these are the characteristics here and these five columns A, B, C, D, E. A is basically uh, if these criteria, these criteria must be met if this is a drinking water that needs to be supplied and this should be after disinfection. So basically we are not talking about, uh, I mean the, this uh, pathogens and some of those basically should be after the disinfection. So as you can see the dissolved oxygen should be high. Uh, so it is minimum, that is something to note there. So dissolved oxygen limit is the minimum 6 milligram per liter while, for example, many of the others are the maximum limits. For example, biochemical oxygen demand should not be more than 2 milligrams per liter. Uh, pathogens uh, in terms of the total, uh, you know, pathogen count uh, per 100 ml should not be more than 50 in drinking water and then similarly other parameters. Some of the heavy metals should be 
uh, basically in the ppm levels basically in milligram per liters like 1 or less than 0 0.1 or so. So, what are the typical water quality parameters that uh, you know one is interested in for example, this is just a loose list I mean these are not restricted uh, they are many more parameters I just for the sake of space I just put these. So, for example, pH alkalinity conductance uh, salinity or uh, you know total dissolved solids uh, dissolved oxygen turbidity uh, biochemical oxygen demand temperature pathogens in terms of the you know coliforms total or the fecal coliforms uh, are some of the water quality parameters which are of interest. So, quickly go through some of these parameters for example, pH it is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration um, oh I must say that some of these are basically very routine this is not a regular class all of you are basically uh, you know teaching these courses or most of you are teaching uh, you know this environmental studies course. So, I am quite sure that you uh, are well aware with that. Uh, but basically this is information that needs to be communicated to the students when we are teaching them. So, we must tell them what are the parameters which uh, are important when we are regulating the water quality or when we are concerned about the water quality. So, pH measures the hydrogen ion concentrations the negative logarithmic of hydrogen ion concentration which is measured as moles per liter and this ranges from 0 to 14 and of course, uh, when the pH is 7 is neutral when it is less than 7 it is acidic and when it is more than 7 it is uh, alkaline and this is this could be measured by you know the very uh, uh, you know affordable uh, pH meters that are available. Alkalinity is kind of opposite of pH basic opposite of acidity is like acid neutralizing capacity. So, most of our water bodies they have basically a bicarbonate carbonate buffer system because of which they have some kind of alkalinity because uh, the the buffer it is the buffer which is provided by the bicarbonate carbonate system which uh, you know resists the change against the uh, any change in the pH. For most of the waters alkalinity is contributed predominantly by bicarbonate ion which is predominantly because of you know the exposure to the open environment where the bicarbonates are uh, you know in equilibrium with the carbonic acid the dissolved carbon dioxide which is in equilibrium with the gas yes concentration of carbon dioxide which is more or less universal about 0 0.03 percent uh, over the earth. Other ions such as orthophosphate and borates may also contribute to alkalinity, but in very small amounts. So, in general when we talk about alkalinity we talk about uh, bicarbonate carbonates and hydroxides and this is measured uh, by titrating uh, a sample of, of, of the water uh, with sulfuric acid and basically using two uh, indicators uh, which give you a total as well as you know the half of the carbonate bicarbonate and uh, alkalinity. Conductivity is uh, basically it is also an important parameter because this tells about how much uh, you know uh, the dissolved ions are there in the water sample uh, and it could be also indirect measure of salinity and it is measured as micro siemens per centimeter and basically uh, uh, if you have higher value of conductivity means uh, this is a better electrical conductor and there are more ions present in the water uh, uh, or the sample of interest. This is uh, basically the dissolved solids. So, which is very important case of uh, you know classification of ground water uh, for example, the composition uh, based on the total dissolved solid content could be uh, you know uh, correct uh, categorized in terms of type of water for example, if the dissolved solid content total dissolved solids is less than 1000 milligrams per liter then this is fresh water uh, if up to 3000 so brackish water uh, it could be saline water moderate and highly saline water if it is more than 10000 uh, uh, TDS or milligram per liters of the TDS and the sea water is basically uh, if it is more than 35000 milligrams per liter. Turbidity is uh, another parameter which is of interest it is measured in nephrometric turbidity units basically it is measured using uh, a nephrometer or a basically a device uh, where basically the light is scattered perpendicular to the direction from where it is uh, you know uh, incident and what we see what the principle is that in the pure water because of not having um, you know the, the colloidal size particles the, the light basically passes through and the detector does not detect anything. 
but in case of cloudy water which is because of the you know the suspended solid as well as the colloidal solids basically there is light scattering which is you know detected at 90 degree angle and that is uh, basically tells indirectly the amount of uh, the turbidity present in the water. This has a good correlation with the concentration of particles in the water and basically some of the turbidity meters, nephilim meters uh, which are available could be used for monitoring this. Uh, then in terms of other uh, parameters like solids which is an indicator of uh, basically presence of any solids. So, turbidity as we said earlier is an indicator of presence of solids in water sample and um, this could be measured in terms of total solid which is basically all the solids present in water and this could be determined by evaporating a water sample up to you know 100 to 110 degree centigrade and drying the residue after that and basically whatever weight is left is basically the total solids. Um, it could be either dissolved solid or undissolved solid and the dissolved solids are those which uh, could be found further by isolating and drying at 180 degree centigrade and the other ones are basically from the previous one uh, are actually causing the most of the turbidity uh, in the water and uh, isolated simply by filtration. Uh, solids would be volatile for example some of the organic dissolved solids and they could be burned off by heating or you know combusting at 550 degree centigrade or around so and then these are mostly uh, organic compounds. Those which could not be removed after all of this are basically fixed solids mostly inorganic uh, you know salts which uh, necessarily do not uh, are mostly uh, related to the hardness for example calcium and magnesium hardness is coming from there. And then of course some of these solids as we will see when we will go to the water treatment and waste for treatment uh, if they are of particular size they could be basically uh, settled and, uh, and then they, they could be used I mean these simple set settling tanks or these could be used to basically separate them out from the rest of the material. So um, I think uh, I will basically close it here but maybe I will just quickly go uh, to and pose some additional discussion questions um, which would be something if uh, you people can you know have some discussion or um, you know when you get time or maybe off time when you have some time think about them. For example, what are the issues with water quality in your city, town and village? Is there any specific water con quality parameter which is an outstanding issue in your area? So when I am saying specific water quality parameter basically that means that already there is a criteria for you know, the water quality. For example, many places fluoride is a problem in groundwater, many places arsenic is a problem. Uh, many places uh, total dissolved solids or hardness is a problem. Uh, so that is something if you can really look individually and uh, you know uh, just put it together for you as well as basically discuss it with your students when you are teaching the course. Uh, other thing is like do you consume stored water or free running wa tap water? Uh, this is also important and why this is important I think also you should think about that. So when we are basically for example as uh, you know one of the centers you know where, where we had interaction mentioned that when you are consuming the free running water basically this is already after disinfection and so more or less the contamination possibility during the storage does not arise and so more or less you get the same water quality almost what is basically being discharged from the you know treatment plant water treatment plant. While during the storage because of you know several factors for example small kids basically you know putting hands uh, in, in some of the stored waters or maybe not having proper cleaning of the storage vessels could basically lead to some of the water contamination during the storage which could be a uh, of concern and, and uh, basically uh, you know let uh, get us uh, like polluted water. So um, we are basically at the end of this uh, first sum module. Uh, I wanted to cover basically you know give you some uh, or many, I mean the idea was basically with this you could sensitize the students about the issues of the, the water whether this is with surface water bodies with the ground water basically make them think about you know why this is a scarce commodity and we should not anymore just believe that if we have money we can just buy water because eventually it is going to be everybody's problem and at the same time how do we really tackle uh, you know the, the, the quality issue so what kind of parameters need to be you know monitored and, um, and how do we monitor them. So basically we will resume tomorrow from where we left today 
uh, we will talk about some of the important parameters like DO, uh, dissolved oxygen, biological oxygen demand, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand and some others and then basically move to water treatment uh, in the first uh, you know lecture and then we will talk about the uh, wastewater treatment in the second one. So, I hope that it was a little bit useful for you and I would like to have your feedback. Uh, thanks a lot and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.